Hi folks, thank you so much for tuning in and checking out our YouTube video. I'm Cindy, a PM on the SDN team, and today I'll be giving a high-level overview about SDN Software Load Balancers, or SLBs, and I'll end with a demo showing how to create SLB rules as well as inbound NAT and outbound NAT rules for VMs attached to a virtual network. So to start, what is SLB? As I just mentioned, SLB stands for Software Load Balancer, and it's needed to provide high availability to an application. What this means is you want to have multiple copies of your application so that if one of the copies goes down, then the other copies are able to work and your application won't go down as a result. So you'll use SLB to host your application on multiple VMs and balance traffic among them. If, for example, you have applications that serve hundreds or even thousands of requests from users, it would be a really bad idea to host your application on a single VM and depend on it to keep up with such a large number of requests and never have any failures. So SLBs solve this issue by evenly distributing network traffic among multiple VMs and allowing you to host your workloads across multiple VMs. And this in turn provides high availability, reliability, and scalability. But how does this work? What happens is you are going to put your application on multiple VMs and each of those VMs will have their own IP address. Let's take an example and assume that you've put the application on 10.0.0.1, 10.0.0.2, and 10.0.0.3. In a scenario where you don't have SLB, you have a risk where if you try to send packets to let's say 10.0.0.1 and for some reason that VM is down, then your packets will get dropped because it will always only send it to 10.0.0.1. So now with SLB, how do you ensure that the packets can go to any of these three VMs? What you do is you define a virtual IP, which is also called a VIP. And the clients who are trying to access your application are now sending the packets to the VIP instead of the IP addresses of your individual VMs, which are called DIPs. So in this case, the DIPs are 10.0.0.1, 10.0.0.2 and 10.0.0.3. Again, these are the actual IP addresses of where the application is hosted. So let's say you send your packet to a VIP, which let's assume is 192.168.1.100. Then what happens is the packet will arrive at something called a SLB MUX. So whenever you configure load balancing, your MUX is actually getting those policies. The MUX is the load balancing VM, and it uses a load balancing algorithm to send the packet to one of the backend VMs, which are your DIPs. The MUX also has logic where it keeps checking the health of each of the DIPs, each of those VMs, and if at some point it sees that one of the VMs is not responding, it will mark it as unhealthy, and it will not send any packets from the client to that VM until it's marked healthy again. And this ensures that a packet is never dropped. In our example, if we send our packet to the VIP, which is 192.168.100, the SLB MUX VM will advertise that VIP over BGP. BGP stands for Border Gateway Protocol, and it's the routing protocol for the internet. It enables the internet to exchange routing information and it tells data requests what is the quickest and most efficient path they need to take to reach the server. And so going back to how the MUX VM will advertise a VIP over BGP, the MUX needs to first establish a BGP session with the top of the rack switch, which is a physical switch. And then after BGP is established, the MUX VM will advertise that any packets that are going to 192.168.1.100 and wants to access that VIP should send the packet to the SLB MUX VM. And it only does this when you have a load balancer configured with the VIP as 192.168.1.100. So the top of the rack switch receives a packet which is coming from the 192.168.1.100 VIP and it sends it to the MUX VM. And since the MUX has the load balancing policies, the MUX will know that if the packet is trying to reach a virtual IP, which is 192.168.1.100, then the DIPs or individual IPs associated with that VIP are 10.0.0.1, 10.0.0.2, and 10.0.0.3. And it will use some load balancing algorithm, which the MUX has, to send the packet to one of the VMs which are hosting the DIPs. And that is essentially how SLB works. So to get SLB configured, we need to first deploy SLB. And to do this, Network Controller and one or more SLB MUX VMs need to be deployed through Windows Admin Center or PowerShell. Network Controller hosts the SLB Manager and it processes SLB commands that come in from Windows Admin Center or PowerShell. It calculates policy for distribution to Azure Stack HCI hosts and SLB MUXs 
and it provides the health status of the SLB infrastructure. So you will need to know your BGP information and ASN number, uh, which is just a unique number assigned to an autonomous system like your network, and your network admin would have all of this information. So you would just need to input that information into the fields in WAC under the load balancer tab, which is part of the SDN infrastructure page in your table of contents. And as you can see in this SLB infrastructure diagram, you also need to ensure that your SLB host agent is running on each of your Azure Stack HCI hosts. And the SLB host agent is needed because it listens for SLB policy updates from network controller. And finally, it's also important to ensure that the routers that serve the host support ECMP routing and BGP, as well as be configured to accept BGP peering requests from the SLB MUXs. With SDN software load balancers, you can configure and manage load balancing, inbound NAT, and outbound NAT for VMs connected to traditional VLANs, as well as VMs connected to virtual networks. But what scenarios would require the use of load balancing, inbound NAT, and outbound NAT? So I've already covered the main use cases of load balancing, which just as a refresher, you can balance traffic among multiple VMs so that if one of the VMs goes down, traffic will be directed to another healthy VM so that the application does not go down as a result. So for example, if I send a packet to 192.168.1.100 and say that I have two backend VMs behind that, let's say 10.0.0.1 and 10.0.0.2, then the load balancing will ensure that sometimes the packets will go to 10.0.0.1 and sometimes the packets will go to 10.0.0.2. And if one of those VMs like 10.0.0.1 is shut down, then the packets will keep going to 10.0.0.2. Inbound NAT is used for port forwarding and it involves translating an external public IP address and port to an internal private IP address and port. And to break that down a little, Inbound NAT lets you connect to VMs by using the load balancer front end IP address and port number, and the load balancer receives the traffic on a port, and based on the inbound NAT rule, it forwards the traffic to a designated VM on a specific backend port. For example, suppose I have a web server within my private network, and I want users on the internet to access it. I would configure inbound NAT to map a specific public IP address and port to the internal IP address and port of the web server. And when users on the internet access the public IP address and port, the inbound NAT rule translates and forwards the traffic to the internal server. This way, external users can reach the web server inside of my private network, even though my web server has a private IP address and is not directly exposed to the internet. So inbound NAT is important for scenarios where you want to provide external access to specific services running on internal VMs while maintaining a level of control and security. Outbound NAT is when you want to provide an outbound rule through the load balancer using a single public IP, but for a collection of VMs that are inside a SDN virtual network. With outbound NAT, you can forward VM network traffic from the SDN virtual or logical network to external destinations using NAT. And the most common use case scenario that we see is for when customers want to configure internal network resources to have internet access. For example, say I'm on a VNet and I want to go to Bing.com. If I don't use outbound NAT, the packet will go to Bing.com, but when Bing.com has to send me the return packet, it will try to send it to my VNet IP address. However, it doesn't know what my VNet IP address is because that is completely in my VNet. So with outbound NAT, we are changing the source IP from my private IP address to the VIP so that when Bing.com sends a response, it will send it to my VIP, which is a public address and therefore is known. I also want to clarify here that you don't necessarily need a load balancing rule if you want to do inbound and outbound NAT. You can do just strictly an inbound NAT rule, or you can do just strictly an outbound NAT rule, or you can do all of them. It isn't the case that one is dependent on another. Now that we've covered the foundational aspects of SDN SLBs, inbound NAT and outbound NAT, I'm going to show a demo of creating SLB rules as well as inbound NAT and outbound NAT for VMs attached to a virtual network on Windows Admin Center. Today, I'm going to walk through a demo showing how to create software load balancing rules, inbound NAT rules, and outbound NAT rules on Windows Admin Center. So what you'll see here is that I'm currently on test cluster RR1N0708 with network controller and two SLB MUXs already deployed.
I also already have two VMs, SLB VM1 and SLB VM2 created that are both attached to the AENP underscore VNet SDN virtual network. So first, I'll be demonstrating how to create a load balancing rule. To do so, I have to create a public IP address that will be the front end IP address reserved for my load balancer. I'm going to click on public IP addresses here under the networking section. And once I'm in public IP addresses, the inventory page opens up and I'll click new. I'll give the public IP address a name, let's say public IP1, and we'll keep the IP address version as IPv4. For IP address allocation method, you can choose static or dynamic. Choosing dynamic means that you are allowing for the IP address to be chosen for you from the public IP pool. But since I have a specific IP address in mind, I'll choose static and give an IP address from my pre-populated subnet, since this is the only subnet I have, which in this case, I'll go with 10.127.135.206. And I'll keep the idle timeout as a default of four minutes and click on submit. And this will create my virtual IP, also called my VIP. So this should populate here in inventory. And now I'll go ahead and click on load balancers. I'll click on new to create my load balancer. I'll give it a name. Let's keep it simple and just put LB1. And we'll keep the type as public IP and the pre-populated public IP address as 10.127.135.206, which was a front end IP that I just created under the public IP addresses extension. And if you hadn't created a public IP address at this point, you can click on this link here, which will redirect you to the public IP addresses extension where you can do that. So since I already have my public IP created and selected, I'll just click on create and this will create my load balancer. So now I'll select the LB1 that I just created and it will take me to a page where I see the IP address that I assigned as the front end IP address here. And now we need to create our backend pool where we'll give our destination IPs or dips. So I'll click on new under backend pools and then I'll give my backend pool a name, let's say BP1, and then I'll click on new under associated IP configurations here, which will show me the interfaces of the VMs that I currently already have. So I'll go ahead and choose SLB VM1 and SLB VM2 to be added into my backend pool, and I'll click on create. This creates my backend pool. And now I'll create a health probe to monitor the health state or connectivity of my backend VMs or DIPs. So a quick tip here is that the health probe is actually required to do anything load balancing. Uh, without it, I could go through and create load balancing inbound NAT and outbound NAT rules, but they wouldn't work. So none of these will work unless I have a health probe. I'll go ahead and select new under health probes and give it a name of HP1. I'll hit the drop down under protocol and you'll notice that we have TCP or HTTP. So HTTP is useful if we were doing a web server. I could put a port and a URI in there and it will do a quick check to see if that URI is still up. So for example, if my URI was let's say bing.com, then I could see is bing.com being hosted on there? And if so, does it respond back to me within a certain amount of time? But in this case, I'll just select TCP, which is just a TCP packet. For port, I'll use port 3389, which is RDP. And for interval, I'll do 30 seconds. The interval is just the range specifying how often we're going to send the health probe. So in this case, I'm saying to my VMs that I'm going to send a TCP probe to port 3389 every 30 seconds. And if one does not respond after, let's say, three failures, I'm marking that VM as unhealthy and packets will no longer be sent to that VM. So that's kind of what that unhealthy threshold is. So I can put three consecutive failures in there and I'll go ahead and hit create to create my health probe. And finally, I'm going to create my load balancing rule by clicking on new under load balancing rules and giving it a name of LBR1. 
I'll leave my pre-populated front end IP configuration field and TCP protocol as is, and then I'll input port 80 for both the front end and back end ports. I will also keep my back end pool and my health probe as is. Uh, these are the back end pool and health probes that we just created, and I'll keep the session persistence as a default. I'll put in four minutes for the idle timeout. I'll leave the floating IP uh, turned off and then I'll click on create to create my load balancing rule. So that's kind of how you create a load balancing rule and now I'll walk through how to create an inbound NAT rule. So this part is simpler since we already have created our public IP address, load balancer and health probe, which are all prerequisites to creating an inbound NAT rule. So all we need to do now is click on new under the inbound NAT rule section and we'll give it a name. Let's name it in one and I'll keep the pre-populated fields for front end IP configuration and protocol. Uh, let's go ahead and put port 3389 for RDP for both the front end and back end ports. And I will keep the network interface, target, network IP configuration, and idle timeout the same. And finally, I'll hit on create to create my inbound NAT rule. Lastly, I will now walk through how to create an outbound NAT rule. So again, since we already have created our public IP address, our load balancer, backend pool, and health probe, which are all prerequisites to creating an outbound NAT rule, all we need to do is click on create new rule under outbound NAT rules and give it a name. I'll name it out one and keep all the pre-populated fields for front end IP configuration protocol and back end pool the same. Lastly, I'll hit create to create my outbound NAT rule. And with that, you now know how to create a SLB rule, inbound NAT rule, and outbound NAT rule for VMs attached to a virtual network on Windows Admin Center. So I hope you found the demo and this overview helpful, and hopefully you now better understand the foundation of SCN software load balancers. And of course, please feel free to leave any comments or questions below and let us know how we can help. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.